everyone. How's it going? Good? Okay. Well, as stated, my name is Rebecca. I come from Vancouver, and I was a professional tennis player. And I'm 22 now, and I retired this year. And I kind of want to tell you the story as to why I decided to retire. I mean, at the young age of 22, that's kind of unexpected. So I think to give you better context, I should start at the beginning. So this is me when I was about four years old, growing up in Vancouver on Halloween one year. And I dressed as a train conductor, just to give you an idea. I was a bit of a tomboy, obviously. And I played a lot of sports. By the age of 10, I decided I wanted to pick up tennis. And I did so with my, my brother and my father and my mother. And they were very supportive of this. And by the age of 12, I decided I wanted to focus only on tennis. So consequently, people started to notice that I had this above average facility for the sport. And they very much supported it. I had the facilities, I had the coaches, and especially I had the support of my parents and my, my family. And just to show, that's my family there. What a beautiful family. <laughs> they were so supportive, and I cannot thank them enough for everything they've done to, for me. And so, as I consequently progressed through the sport, I started to play nationally and internationally. I got to the point where I was 17, and I just finished high school, and I had the choice to either go to university or go professional. And this was a major fork in the road. I didn't know what to do. University on scholarship for free is kind of hard to pass up, but I, I decided to go professional. And so, embarking on this journey, I slowly rose up the ranks, and I managed to get to New York at the US Open. And I played against Venus Williams in the second round. And for those of you who don't know your tennis, Venus Williams was, at the time, ranked number four in the world. And I had never faced anyone of this caliber before. And so <laughs> I was able to push her to 7-6 in the first set, which was very, very close. But then it went 6-3 in the second, and I lost. But it was an amazing opportunity, one that I'll never forget. And at the end of the match, she said, now I know what it's like to play myself, which is incredible. I mean, to get a compliment from a, a world-class athlete who many people respect and look up to, and she will undoubtedly go to the Hall of Fame, says that about you, you kind of take notice. So I <laughs> said, so, gee, you know, I have this ability. Maybe I should continue to pursue it. And so here's another shot of me, actually from the US Open that year. I played on Arthur Ashe Stadium, by the way, and it was televised, which I had never experienced before. <laughs> so I rose after that from about 100 in the world to number 38, which was my career high ranking. And nobody was prepared for that. Not me, not my parents, nor my coaches, not even the tennis association. Nobody was prepared. So I had to quickly learn and pick up how to deal with media, how to deal with fans, traveling nonstop. And consequently, I also miss my family at home. I was homesick a lot of the time. I felt I was missing milestones in people's lives. Not only their lives, but my life. I was never home for my birthday not home for my friends or family's birthdays. I missed weddings, births, deaths, you name it, I probably missed it. Not only was that going on, but I was also sad. I didn't, I didn't know what it was, and I hid it from everyone. I didn't want to be a burden. Because, I mean, as an athlete, you're supposed to be strong, right? But I distinctly remember when I was traveling in Birmingham, England, and I was on the bus going to the tennis center, and I started crying. I don't know why I was crying. There was no reason. Nobody had died. Nobody was sick. I was just sad, and I couldn't contain it. And my coach looked at me and asked what was wrong, and I said I didn't know. And he pulled me aside after, and we talked about it, and he said, you know, you need to get help. You need professional help. Something isn't right here, and you need to deal with it. And so I'm undoubtedly grateful that he sent me to see a therapist because I was clinically diagnosed with depression. And that was a very scary moment in my life, because I was confused. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to talk to, because it's seen as such a weakness. For a professional athlete to have a weakness is definitely not good. So I kept it to myself. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my friends. It was just between me and my coach. So it went on like this for a while. But I couldn't hold it in any longer. I had to tell my family and my friends, so I did that. 
It was very difficult for me, but opening up to them was probably the best thing I've ever done. But I didn't tell the public. I continued to play tennis at the same time while I was battling with my depression. And this was so difficult for me. When I was at the top of my game, at number 38 in the world, I was my saddest. You can see this is me in Japan, in Tokyo, actually. And I looked so happy there. And that's my usual goofy self. I'm making faces, you know. But inside, I was so sad. There were days I could not get out of bed. I could not get dressed, let alone go on court and face an opponent and put a smile on my face. But I still did it. And I think that takes immense strength and character, not only for myself. I'm not trying to boast about myself here. I'm saying generally, people, to put that mask on, it's the strongest thing they can ever do. So I continued to play, but it wasn't working. So I took a six-month break to help better myself, to feel better, to get healthy. Upon doing that, I decided to go back to the sport again. But it still wasn't, it wasn't right. Something wasn't right, and I had lost the passion for the sport that I had once loved. It was more of a job than an actual love anymore. So as of February, I decided to retire. Now, who at 22 can say they've retired? <laughs> really, like, I thought it was the most hilarious thing ever. I was able to hold a retirement party with all my friends, <laughs> and I, I honestly did that. I had a dinner with my friends and drinks, and we celebrated the fact that I was closing one chapter of my life, and I had so many more things to look forward to. And now I'm at university, I'm first year, <laughs> with all the 18-year-olds in my class, it's very interesting. <laughs> but yeah, that is my life. But why am I telling you this? Why am I informing you about the struggles and trials and tribulations that I went through during my career? The key point is that I want to highlight that athletes can be weak as well. In our society, we're meant to show complete strength. We're supposed to be impenetrable. But oftentimes, we don't feel that way. And I think we need to make people more aware that it's OK to be weak. It's OK to feel sad. You can share it. But people are still slipping through the cracks in these foundations that we have. We have organizations set up for mental health. We have everything at our fingertips, yet people still do not reach out because they're scared. These individuals, like myself, didn't know where to go. I had no idea what I was doing, and I didn't want to be a burden, as I said. So I just, I wouldn't have gotten help had my co coach not told me and forced me to get it. So in a way, my challenge to you is to take it more on a personal level. Instead of saying, well, we have these organizations available. Why aren't people getting help? We oftentimes say, oh, how's it going? You know, oh, fine. People brush it off. But I think we should take it one more level and say, how are you actually feeling? How are you feeling today? And the answer might be surprising sometimes. We need to take it upon ourselves and not just assume that help is out there, and that people will take it. We need to see that our friends and family can be weak and that we can support them that way. So I don't know what you've learned from that, but if you can take it to just being more personal, around people, and seeing that a weakness can actually be a strength, I think that's amazing. And through telling my story, I want to show people that, you know, through the process of life, basically, you can grow stronger and stronger. And right now, I feel stronger than I ever have been. Stronger than any tennis match I've played. Stronger than when I was in New York on Arthur Ashe Stadium against Venus Williams. And I feel happier and healthier than I've ever been. So I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the speeches. Thank you.